All right, well, good afternoon or good evening or maybe good morning for some of you. We're so excited that you've joined us here today and especially if you came here on time so that we can start on time. Thank you so much for answering this question, Paul. My name is Sergey. I'm going to be your host at the workshop today. Now, I want to make sure you get the most out of this class. And the way we're going to do this is I might ask you to do some things that you might find maybe slightly outside of your comfort zone. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to stand upside down or try to jump on one leg, no. Of course, everything we're going to be doing today is going to be related to the topic of our webinar today, which is going to be the GMAT math. Now, if you are familiar with the concept of a comfort zone, this should not really be new to you. The learning really happens just outside of that comfort zone. So I'd like to encourage you to really participate. We'll do quite a few questions today. You're about to learn some strategies. Take some notes. Take as much as you possibly can from this short two-hour webinar. If you're game for that, give me a thumbs up in the chat box. And we're going to start now with a GMAT question. Perfect. Thanks for giving me a thumbs up. Let's do a GMAT question. I'm going to give you about um, maybe 30 seconds or so to do this question. This is just going to be a warm up. Here's the question. All right, well, I hope you've answered this question by now. Please choose your answer. I'll give you 10 more seconds to choose your answer. So if you don't know what the answer is, that's okay. Choose anyway. Pretend that you know. Close your eyes and visualize the answer. All right, awesome. Let me end the poll right now and I'll actually share with you what everybody received. So about 40% of people chose D and, uh, and we have a quite an interesting distribution. Uh, we have a vote for every single one of the answer choices. So let's first find out what is actually the right answer. Tadam, it is D. All right, well, how did we get there? How did we actually get to that answer? And, and as we go in through this information, please pay attention to not only what is the right explanation, uh, but also what have you done perhaps to get that answer? And most importantly, what could you do differently next time? If you've made a mistake, that's completely okay. Nobody's going to judge here. And this poll was really truly anonymous. So let me ask you a question. In order to do this question, what did we really need to know? What kind of mass did we need to remember? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we needed to remember what's that exponent? Uh, and here specifically, we're dealing with the third power of seven. And the third power of seven is nothing but seven times seven times seven. Now, it's a pretty big number, but if you know that seven times seven is 49, and it's almost 50, you can actually do this in your head in about 30 seconds. I hope you didn't use a calculator. I forgot to mention this, that the calculator isn't actually permitted on the test, but this is what you could have received, 343. All right, so we need to know what's an exponent, that's number one. We also need to know how to multiply and divide, uh, how to multiply seven times seven times seven. And we also needed to understand how do we divide? How do we divide that number by five? And most importantly, what's going to be the remainder? So if we divide that number by five, well, 340 is the next number that's divisible by five. And what's left? Well, what's left is three. So our answer is three, which was actually answer choice D. 
Now, you might be wondering, what's really involved with doing questions on the GMAT? Let me give you a little bit of a preview. And we're going to go and ask people who create the test, the GMAC, the Graduate Management Admissions Council. Here's a quote directly from the GMAC. By the way, this is a quote that I, I grabbed from the, the presentation that GMAC shared with us at a very special conference just for test prep organizations. So usually they would invite about, I would say, 10 most respected test prep organizations from across, in our case, North and South America, and they would share a few things with us. And that's a direct quote. So you need to know not more than was generally taught in the secondary school classes. What exactly you need to know? Arithmetic, some elementary algebra, and some commonly known geometry concepts. And as you could see, this specific question is exactly what we need to know. And we can actually do this question. And there's some shortcuts for multiplying 49 by 7. It's almost 50 times 7, which is 350. And we need to knock off 7 because it's 49 and not 50. All right. Well, I know that 40 of you are still in the 40% of you are still in the comfort zone because you got this question right, and about 60% of you, and a little more because not everybody answered, uh, perhaps are already outside of a comfort zone. But the way to expand our comfort zone is to take the learning from one question, the learning from one experience, and apply it to the next experience. So I want to make sure that we do this, that we really iron out this strategy. So how about I give you one more question? Who's up for that? And I'm going to give you a little more time because we've just learned something new. I'm going to give you one more question. And I'll give you, I would say, maybe about a minute. How's that? And I'll do the same thing. I will launch a poll about 30 minutes, 30 seconds in, so that you can choose the answer. Ready? Here's the question. Twenty more seconds. All right, you didn't choose the answer yet. Please do it right now. I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and done. All right, let me share the results with you. Okay, well, uh, again, now we have 65% of people who chose the answer D. Um, we'll find out in a moment why or what, what exactly have you done. Um, and this is now a, a majority vote. Nobody chose A, and the majority of people chose D. Um, at D sometimes, uh, I know some of my clients say, well, D stands for done. I know I want to get this question done. That's why I choose D. Uh, so let's see. Let's see if uh, this is actually 
um, the, uh, the way we're going to approach this. Now, if you can share in a chat box, what have you done? Just, um, just maybe share with me just a one word or a couple of words. How did you do it? And again, I hope you didn't use a calculator because that's not really something you can do on the test. So just give me some feedback. What exactly have you done to get this question right? Uh, if it was just a guess, let me know. That, well, it was just a guess and that's okay. All right, yeah, thanks for being honest. Okay, we also maybe saw some uh, dependencies, some patterns, right? The question before was just like what we're doing right now. It was seven and it was a three and then a five and it, almost everything looks exactly the same, right? Um, so let's actually see if these are the right answer. Let me stop sharing so that it doesn't distract you. Well, there are a couple of ways of approaching this question. I want to show you both of these ways, and then I'll let you decide which of these ways you think is better. Let's call the first way the theory way, which is we're going to do the question exactly the same way that like we've done it before. Well, look, I get it. Multiplying seven onto itself 13 times will take a little bit more time than multiply it onto itself seven times, but you can technically do this. And in fact, this is the answer you're going to get. Uh, and then, of course, you can divide it by five. Now, if, if you did use a calculator, you're going to get this answer. So the calculator isn't really going to help very much here because um, this is not our remainder. The remainder is what's left. So if we divide this number by five, then we would know that we get some sort of an answer and two is going to be the remainder. So you actually do the work. Uh, what's the problem with this approach? Well, first of all, we don't get a calculator. And secondly, for that reason, this would take a really long time. So, and again, thanks for sharing. Thank you for sharing what you've done. And, and thanks for being honest. Thanks for sharing this. I know um, some of you actually uh, shared the strategy we're going to talk about now. Some of you made certain assumptions along the way. So that's completely okay. That's how we learn, right? We're all here to have fun. So I, I'll let you judge whether this is a, an approach you want to take on a test, but I want to show you a different approach. Let's call this approach the mastery way of doing this question. Now, this is the way that we would normally be teaching in our class. And um, well, I would assume that you know some basic number theory, um, but actually I'm gonna step back maybe a little bit and remind you what perhaps we've learned in school. And that is, how do we do on multiplications? Well, what would we do is we'll do this. So imagine you have two big numbers to multiply and I would just pick some numbers out of a hat. So these numbers you see in, on the screen right now. And when I start my one multiplication, what I would do is I would take the digit at the end that is called the units digit, and I would multiply these two digits, six times seven, and of course, six times seven, I'm going to get 42. Now, what I would do next is I would take the four and carry it over to the next digit, but the two I'm going to keep where it is. And what's interesting is if we were to go through all of these calculations, that's probably gonna take a long time, what we would notice is that we're gonna keep carrying over numbers to the next digit, but the two is just going to stay where it is. There's nothing that's going to change that two anymore. And that's really what the essence of this strategy is. So we call it the units digit strategy because it has to do with the units digits. Uh, it works for multiplication, it works for addition, it also works for subtraction with a little bit of a caveat that sometimes you have to borrow. For example, in this case, that if you were to uh, subtract these two numbers, the last digit is actually going to be nine because we have to borrow from the previous digit called the tens digit, so it's gonna be 16 minus seven. But the strategy works every time. It, it doesn't work for division, but it works for the other three operations. Okay, so now that we've reviewed what this is all about, let's see how we can apply it to this question. Well, you remember what we've just done is we said, well, if 343 is my answer, I didn't actually have to divide. 
I know the answer ends in a three. And if I divide that by five, I know there was 340 and three is left. So for this question, if I were to find the last digit of seven to the power of 13, I would be okay, I'd be done. I can use exactly the same strategy. So now I'm going to try to find that last digit. Well, let, let, me, let me see what I can do. Now I know seven to the 13 is a fairly large number. So let's start with seven to the one. Well, that's easy. It certainly just ends in a seven. It's a very small number. If I were to now multiply this by another seven, I'm gonna get seven times seven and that's 49. And I use these dots here because even though we have a single digit number, it doesn't really matter. If I had 17, it would work exactly the same way. So seven times seven, that's 49, right? Again, I only care about the last digit, so nine is left. Well, let's keep going. We have up to 13, so let, let's speed it up a little bit. Seven to the three. So we take that nine from the previous operation, and we multiply it again by seven. We just keep accumulating those sevens. Nine times seven, that's 63. I'm sure you remember your tens multiplication table. We just care about the three. Let's keep it. Let's keep going. Multiply it by seven again. Seven to the four, that three times seven is 21. Again, we just keep the one. All right, let's keep going. Got to go up to 13. Seven to the five. So now we take the one multiplied by seven and we get a seven. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is going to happen if we go to seven to the six? Seven to the seven, seven to the eight. Well, if we have a number that ends in a seven, just like we had with seven to the one, we multiply it by seven again, we're gonna get, again get 49. So it looks like our pattern will repeat. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing this in the chat box. The pattern will repeat. And by the way, we have 10 digits in our numerical system. And there is a pattern for each one of them. And for some of them, the pattern is a little shorter, but there is no digit where the pattern is more than four. So once you get to four, you're done. The pattern will just keep repeating. For some of them, it repeats uh, sooner, like one to the power of one is, and one to the power of two is, is always one. So it repeats after every one. But here for seven, it repeats after four, which is the longest pattern you'll find in any digit. All right, well, that's actually good news because if I can keep repeating that pattern, I know I'm gonna get to seven to the 12, that's going to give me one at the end, right? Because I'm at the end of the pattern, so I'm gonna get to one. And then with seven to the 13, I'm coming back up. So I'm going to sort of restart that pattern essentially at seven. I hope this makes sense. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box in the Q&A box. But what we've just discovered is seven to the 13 is some sort of a humongous number that ends in a seven. We don't care what that number is. We just need the remainder of division of that number by five. So what do you think is going to be the remainder now? If we divide something that ends in a seven by five, just please put it in the chat box. What's the remainder? Perfect, perfect. All right, yes, yes, yes. The remainder is, you're absolutely right. You're all absolutely right. The remainder is going to be two. And we can actually do this in two minutes and we can get the right answer. A little more enjoyable, right? And let me tell you something even better. Once you get really good at practicing these strategies and once you recognize what strategy to use where so you don't waste time thinking about what to do, you can do this in less than two minutes. You can probably do this maybe in a minute maybe even less. So that's good news. And that actually brings me to a very important point. I promised I'm going to share with you what's the one thing that separates the scores of 500 from the scores of 700. And that literally is one thing. I would really like to encourage you to maybe take a, a different color of a pen and, and write this down maybe in big letters. And that's gonna be this one word, 
So what's that word? And by the way, this is the quote from the GMAC. Please put things in the chat box. What's the one word that separates 500 and 700? People who have 500 have the knowledge. They know the theory. People who have 700, they got what? Starts with an S. Yes, exactly. They got the skill. That's what separates the 700 plus score. If you have a skill of identifying what the question is asking, if you have a skill identifying what's the right strategy to use, if you have a skill of using the right strategy quickly, managing your time well, you can do this question. If you simply know what's an exponent, how to add and multiply, this question becomes really, really hard. Now, I love using analogies. So I'm gonna use a few analogies here throughout the class because that's how I better understand things. So I hope that that's going to help you a little bit better understand this as well. Now imagine you want to learn how to swim. I don't know if any of you are Big Bang Theory fans, but this was actually from one of the episodes when Sheldon was trying to convince everybody he knows how to swim because he read a book on swimming. I, do you really believe him? So that's the knowledge. And we used to think that knowledge is power because this is how the school taught us. I, 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 I don't know if you remember, but I certainly do. In my high school and middle school, we were taught the knowledge, right? And sometimes we weren't really taught how to use it, but we were made believe that that's what's gonna make us successful in life. And what separates somebody who has the knowledge from somebody who really masters the skill is really that practice, that, that focus on mastering the skill. So that somebody who knows how to swim, who actually jumped into the pool, hopefully with somebody who knows how to swim, like Michael Phelps, is gonna be so much better at swimming than somebody who just reads a book. So, so what's important for these questions we've just done? Well, we talked about the theory, but in terms of the skill. Well, first of all, uh, knowing what to do, knowing what strategy to use. Secondly, confidence to use it. Now, confidence is actually a skill. Believe it or not, just like any skill, you can learn it. And in fact, if you haven't seen, we are going to be doing a workshop tomorrow. It's at 12 noon and 7 p.m. Eastern time. There's a workshop where we invite a guest speaker who's training people for peak, peak performance. He trained a lot of athletes and a lot of business people. Who's actually going to train you in one hour how to have more confidence. I, I think it's really amazing. I'm so looking forward to it. Uh, now, a couple more skills. Some of you mentioned, oh, I see a pattern in that question. So recognizing pattern is an important skill. Now, also recognizing what the question's asking and what's the question testing is a skill. Now, the questions we've just done, they're classified as algebra because they deal with exponents. But it's really all about numbers, right? There were no, no variables and it's all about digits. It's all about understanding what's called the number property. So we've essentially reclassified those questions so we can deal with them. Right? So that's also going to be important. And in fact, I wanna bring back to that question that when we talked about what's most important, I've done a lot of these seminars. In fact, I've done a lot of the in-person ones, a lot of online ones, probably over 200. And what I found is that if you want to get the most out of these seminars, then here's what you can do at the beginning of the seminar. You can ask yourself three very simple questions. So if you'd like to play along, I think you're gonna find this valuable and it's gonna take less, just literally a minute. So just in your head, you don't have to share this. Ask yourself this question. When it comes to taking the next step in my career, which is the GMAT and the MBA is all about, what's the most important thing for me? But what's most important for me when it comes to that next step in my career? So answer this question in your head, please, if you would. And then as you answer this question, answer this question. What about that is most important for me? You know, for some of you, it would be to make a career transition soon. And what's really important for me is that I'm going to start making more money. I'm going to start liking what I really do, right? 
but this is an answer that you're going to have. So what's most important for you? What specifically about that is most important? And then finally, just on a personal level, if you were to have that right now, what's it gonna do for you? And as you're thinking about this, what I'd like to invite you to, uh, to notice is that what's really important to you is going to relate very closely to the sort of information and sort of strategies we're going to discover today. So that you can recognize the direct relationship with everything we're talking about here with things that are most important for you. Now, I, I, I do have to admit, I haven't officially introduced myself. So, uh, so I, I apologize. Let me do that really, really quickly. Uh, so my name is Sergey, and I'm instructor at Admit Master. And I wanted to show you uh, what actually qualifies me to, uh, to teach in this workshop. Here's my official score report. Uh, as you could see, it's 750, and I've scored 750 after about two weeks. Uh, now, I'm not saying this to impress you. It impresses me. I think that's, that's really, really cool. But one thing that I found is um, I've met a lot of people who, when I told them this story, they said, well, not a lot of people, but quite a number of people uh, who told me, well, look, big deal, right? I scored you know, 770 in, in a week, or I scored you know, 7, 760 in a day. And I really became fascinated why some people, well, for some people it's so easy, and for some other people it's so hard. In fact, the university I went to, I have a master's of mathematics. I went to a university, which is, I call it the rocket science university because I actually used to work on algorithms to send rockets into space. And what's interesting is every single person I met from that university told me exactly the same thing. They all told me I scored 750, 770, 780. In fact, 770 or 750 was the lowest score I've met. And everybody said, well, I've just studied for a couple of weeks. So I, I started working in this industry and I really became obsessed trying to find an answer. What makes some people get this so easy? And for some other people, it's so excruciatingly hard. And I had to start somewhere, right? So uh, it was about 10, 11 years ago where I said, okay, look, uh, we got to find a way to teach other people the same because it's not like these people are more gifted. They probably did something different. And what I've done, I actually started actively looking for people on LinkedIn, through my friends, uh, through people in my own MBA, who scored very, very highly. And I started asking them, well, what have you done? Then as I was teaching the GMAT for so many years, I was interviewing our own clients. And I've been doing this now for 11 years. What have you guys done? And just to start with, I found people who were the best in the world at what they did at that time in the late 2000s who were teaching the GMAT. For example, one of the people who was developing a program with us uh, was the person who worked for one of the big American companies, test prep organizations, who was both the number one instructor in the world for that organization. There were over 599 percentile instructors. There was also another guy who uh, was for another very big company was writing a lot of books. That's the company that has like 10 books. So he was writing a lot of them. Uh, he's from Latin America. And I also worked with him. So we've, we've built this program that really takes the best of what everybody has to offer. And then we said, okay, how can we now make it simple? Instead of 10 books of theory, how can we make it so simple that anybody can follow? Now, of course, it's going to require work. It's going to require strategies but how can we make it more intuitive? And I'm super excited to tell you that uh, in just in the last five days, now I've been doing this for 10 years, so I'm just giving you a small slice. Just in the last five days, I got five phone calls from our clients who got scores above 700. Uh, this was incredible. Just in the last five days, here's just one example, Daria. So she started our course in April uh, with a score of 380. And she said, that's, uh, no, that's, that's kind of my dream. I don't really know if I can get it, but I will absolutely, this is what I want. So 380, she took a six week course and she was studying for seven more weeks. So she averaged about 20, 25 hours a week. Just gave me a call, 
last week, I think it was Friday, and said, wow, I've just done a test, just walked out of a test center, got a score of 700. So here's, uh, here's her, her story. And I know a lot of people very often would ask, well, there the, are the different programs for the GMAT, and, and what's the guarantee? You know, it, does this program guarantee my success? And, and I think that that's a little bit of an unfair question, because uh, when we talk about guarantee, I think what's a little more important is a track record. Is it something that can help you and did help other people? Because the only guarantee is that you're guaranteed to, to really focus on getting good results. Right? If, you, if you are focused and if you get the right help, you can absolutely do this. Now I'll give you the exact step-by-step -step strategy of how to do this, but I wanted to give you this a little bit of a piece of motivation and also share my personal story Hopefully, you can get a little pieces from that story and, and from some of the other stories I'll share with you today. So here's what we are actually about to do. Now, I gave you a question to challenge you. We already talked about the one thing that separates the 500 and the 700 scores. We'll keep discussing different strategies you can use right now. Do you think you can use that Unis Dizzy strategy right now? Give me some uh, feedback in the chat box. I really want to make sure that this is something you can walk away with and say, yes. I, if I see a question that's similar to, yes, thank you so much uh, for sharing this. I can do this. I, I also are, I promise to you, if you watched the video from me yesterday, I promised I'm going to tell you what are the two things you must have on the day of the test. Now, if you have these two things, you're guaranteed to do well. If you don't have at least one of them, you're guaranteed to not. So that's going to be really important. We'll talk about that. And of course, I, I also promised I'm going to give you the step-by-step -step one to get a 700 plus score. It's going to be a three-step one. You'll get it absolutely today. Uh, I'll hold you up with some resources to help you study at home. I know we're all studying at home. Uh, sometimes we have a little hard time to concentrate, but um, just give me some feedback. If you are able to focus right now, then I think you can do this. Right. We've been focusing for about half an hour. Uh, we've done some cool things. We're going to continue doing more cool things. Absolutely, yes, perfect. Thank you for, uh, thank you for giving me that feedback. Uh, we will have some time for Q&A, and uh, we're going to have some amazing bonuses. By the way, just a little preview. We're going to have an amazing uh, guest speaker today at the end of this workshop. I really love doing workshops with him. Uh, he, he is an executive director from the Western University Ivy School of Business who is going to share with you what actually does it take to get into a business school. And he's going to be around to answer questions as well. So lots of things to do in the next an hour and a half. But let's see, how does it actually fit into that overall story? Well, we're talking here today about math. So math is actually not the name of that section. That section is called a little bit different and I've just shared with you here on the screen the structure of the test. If somebody can please notice a pattern and please put that one word in the chat box. What is that pattern? There's one word that's a pattern here. Yes, Brandon, thank you so much. That is the word reasoning. So when you look at the GMAT, you would notice that it's not really about knowing math, and, and you, you notice this today, and if you go to our verbal refresher class, you also notice it's not really about speaking English. It's really all about reasoning. And reasoning, remember higher order reasoning skills? So we're going to learn today how to reason a little bit better when it comes to the GMAT questions. Oh, and by the way, reasoning is a skill. We can totally learn it. If you ever heard of somebody is not logical or doesn't know how to reason well, well, they just haven't learned it. Or maybe didn't want to learn it, but that's a skill, just like any other skill. Now, the quant and the verbal sections are the sections that actually contribute towards the total score. The other two sections do not. They are still reported to the business schools. And if you do take an online exam, then the analytical writing assessment, the essay is not going to be there. Just the quant, the verbal, and the integrated reasoning sections. Now, the quant and the verbal sections make up each 50% of your score on the exam. So let's talk about what's actually going to show up in the quant section. 
There are two types of questions. By the way, we will talk about both of them today. The one you've already seen is called the problem solving question. What we need to do, okay, give me, please put in a chat box. What do you think we need to do in a problem solving question? What immediately comes to mind? Problem solving question, what do I need to do? Please put it in the chat box. Yes, absolutely. Tatiana is saying solve the problem. That's what most people think is that I need to solve a problem. Well, let's shift our mind a little bit. Some of you are saying provide the solution. Well, let, let's reframe this a little bit. And I would say, yeah, we're getting close. We actually need to find the solution. Now, where is the solution to a problem? Where do you think it is? That answer to the problem, where is it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is in the answer choices. So we just have to find it, right? So we don't always have to solve a problem. We have to find the answer. Data sufficiency is something where we don't have to find an answer. We just need to recognize what kind of information is going to be required for us to find one unique answer. That's what that sufficiency is about. We will do a that sufficiency question. Now, verbal reasoning, we'll talk about this in two weeks. So I'm not gonna spend any time here except to remind you that there's three types of questions, sentence correction, critical reasoning, and reading comprehension. We spend a lot of time on the verbal section in our course, about half of the time, and in our refresher class, there'll be a proper refresher class on verbal, where we're gonna spend about as much time as we spent today to reviewing a verbal question. And we'll dig a little bit into the theory, and we'll do a few questions as well, so that you can see how to reason through these problems. Now, when, we, when it comes to math, I want to ask you a question. Is the GMAT math hard? Let's be honest. Is it hard? In fact, I'd like to ask you this question just in a super, super quick poll. And I'm going to share with you what, um, what we hear often. So many people would say, look, math is, uh, it isn't really that hard but I've done this a really long time ago. That would be the most common answer. The second most common answer would be, uh, well, uh, the, the way how I do math now is by using a calculator. In fact, some of us, uh, we, we have a lot of clients. I mean, we are located in Toronto, our headquarters are. Uh, we do offer classes in other cities as well and now uh, online, but Toronto is a financial hub. So, we have like lots of people who work in banks who would come to us and can't add numbers. Because if you work in a bank, very often there'll be a directive from your boss saying, you are not allowed to do mental math because if you are dealing with people's money, you have to use a calculator or you have to use an Excel spreadsheet, right? Some of you are saying, time pressure. I know I can do this math in five minutes, but I have two. And in fact, I don't even have two for every question. Sometimes I have much less time. So, so thanks so much for sharing this. Uh, that, that's, uh, that what, what, you're, what you're sharing with me right now is what we, exactly what we see, right? Easy to make a simple mistake and the questions are absolutely confusing and we forgot many of the formulas. Now, and again, the way to do this is just, we need to learn the strategies. We need to keep reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing them. In fact, what I'd like to do, I know we talked about remainders. I know we talked about division. I know we talked about exponents. So I just want to put the nail in the coffin of those exponents and remainders and do one more question with you. How's that? One more question. I'm going to give you a minute to think about this question. I'll ask you again for an answer, and then we'll talk about this question.
All right, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds, choose an answer, and we're going to close the poll and talk about this question. All right. Well, about half of you chose E, and then we have a few, uh, somebody, we have a few people who chose B, C, and D. So let's actually talk about this question. Now, there are a few ways of doing this question. Let's call the first way the theory way, and that is, well, we've just learned to find the last digit. So it looks the same as we've done before. So 10 to the 50 minus one, that's some sort of a one number with a bunch of zeros we have a subtract one, uh, so it ends in a nine. And the question is, where do we go from here? The number ends in a nine. So is that helpful? Uh, we have a lot of numbers that end in a nine, but the remainder when we divide by 11 is different. And notice that it's not 10, right? So uh, the GMAT was actually gentle with us. They didn't give, give us an answer choice, nine. I think we probably need to modify that question for the next time. So we're dealing with a division by 11, which is a little bit different than finding the last digit. So recognizing what is the right strategy or what is the strategy is going to help us find the answer is going to be important. So let's review how do we actually divide the number by 11. In fact, how can we figure out if a number is divisible by 11? Well, we can take a couple of numbers. So uh, for example, if we take a number such as maybe 33 or 132, well, these numbers are divisible by 11 because for two digit integer, just as long as the digits are the same, then we know it's divisible by 11. For a three digit integer, there's also a shortcut. So if we add those two digits at the beginning at the end and they would add up to the one in the middle, so one plus two is three, then that number is also divisible by 11. But what if we have a number such as this? And we want to figure out if it's divisible by 11. Well, here's what we can do. There is actually a way. And that has to do with knowing divisibility rule by 11. Now, I know you probably learned some divisibility rule, like how do you know if a number is divisible by three, you sum the digits, right? Or by nine or by six or by five. So I'd encourage you to learn these strategies because they are important for the test. They're going to save you time. But when it comes to 11, here's what we can do. We're going to start with the final digit, which is in our case nine, so that's our unit's digit. And then we're going to add up the digits, skipping one as we go along. So we're going to add nine plus eight plus two, and two plus eight plus nine, so that's 10 plus nine, that's 19. We have some digits left, so we have one and seven left, so we're gonna add one and seven, and that's going to be eight. All right, so it always works. It always works exactly the same way as long as you remember that process, you can always find how, whether any number is divisible by 11. So now we're going to subtract 19 and eight, so eight from 19, and we're going to get 11. As long as you get here a number that's either 11 or zero or any sort of a multiple of 11, then you know that the original number was also a multiple of 11. Now, this is actually a pretty difficult question, believe it or not. This question could have been even more difficult if the remainder was not zero, if the number was actually not divisible by 11. So that strategy still works because if it's not 11, it is going to give you a remainder, right? So if you are looking for that very, very difficult questions, then please know that this strategy also will help you find the remainder. So if it gave us three, the remainder is going to be three. If it gave us 14, the remainder is going to be three. All right, so now that we reviewed the theory, and again, like I mentioned that I, today I wanna to be a little gentle with you, so I'm gonna break things down in the exact step-by-step -step starting from the basic theory. I'll tell you what usually happens in our class, but we're going a little bit slower. So now let's talk about how we can use this. Let's call this the strategy way. Well, 10 to the 50 minus one, that's a bunch of nines. 
Now, uh, here's an interesting question. Can you please put in the chat box, I'd like to get some feedback from you, how many nines is this number? All right, what's interesting is that so far I got about 10 responses. Every single one of them says we have 49 nines. So I don't know, I'll be honest with you. I wanna find out. Now I've obviously seen this question before, but I would pretend that I see this question for the first time. So I wanna find this out. So 10 to the 50 minus one, I wanna see how many nines I'm going to have. So I'm going to take a smaller number. I'm going to say, well, how about 10 to the one minus one? So that's nine, so I get one nine. Okay, how about 10 to the two minus one? Okay, so that's 99, so I got two nines. Okay, how about 10 to the three minus one? That's nine ninety-nine, so I got three. Oh, you see a pattern? So 10 to the 50 minus one, it's gotta be 50 nines. Right? Again, we just tested things out. We, we noticed a pattern. That's really what the GMAT's all about, is being able to comfortably do these types of things. And by the way, this is something you can learn, not just the exact strategies, but also think that way. That's the most important thing if you want to get a score of 700. So we got 50 nines, and now we can use that strategy. We have the exact number, so we can split them up. And of course, we're not going to write down this whole number. We know we're gonna have 25 nines on top and 25 nines at the bottom, because if we have 50 and we keep skipping one, we're gonna end up having 25. So 25 times nine, I'm not gonna calculate this of course, minus 25 times nine, well, that's a zero. So what this tells me is that that number is divisible by 11. So 10 to the 50 minus one, that's divisible by 11. And of course, because it's divisible, the remainder is gotta be zero. That leads me to the right answer. It is indeed E. And you can do this two minutes, maybe even less, if you are really practicing this skill. Now let's play a little game. What if all of these strategies and all of these division rules have been sucked out of your brain as you walked into the room, right? It's just sometimes when we get too stressed out, we forget things. But what's interesting is that we forget things, but we keep the skills. And when you practice a skill over and over and over again, it becomes a habit. And you get to keep your habits. In fact, on the day of your test, the habits are what's going to determine your success. So one of the things that we can do is we could say, look, I have a habit thinking certain, a certain way. I know I can't deal with big numbers. I'd like to deal with small numbers. 10 to the 50 minus one is a huge number. I can't really possibly deal with it. I forgot this division rule. What I will do instead is this, I will, Pick a smaller number, 10 to the one minus one, that's nine. So nine, if I divide it by 11, I know it's a little tricky because we normally don't divide a small number by a big number, but if you divide nine by 11, 11 goes into nine, well, it actually doesn't go, it goes zero times and the remainder is going to be nine. What's left is nine. All right, let's keep going. 10 to the two minus one, that's 99. If I divide 99 by 11, 11 goes into 99 nine times and nothing's left, zero remainder. All right, great. Uh, let's maybe test one or two more. So 10 to the three minus one, that's 999. I know that 990 is divisible by 11. I get a remainder of nine. 10 to the four, I can keep going if I want to. I don't think I will because I noticed a pattern. Do you notice any pattern? It looks like no matter what we do, the remainder is always going to be nine or zero, no matter what we do. 
So as we keep going, it's always going to be nine or zero, nine or zero, nine or zero. Well, guess what? Nine is not among the answer choices. So the answer has to be zero. And we can do this in one minute, even if we don't remember the divisibility rule, but we got the right habit. We got the way to think the way the GMAT wants us to think. And that's why we can deal with this question. And again, I just wanna remind you, this is not an easy question. And we can do it multiple different ways. When we're tired and stressed out and we're really alert and we're all excited and ready to go. Now, if you're doing an online exam, one section is first. So hopefully you're gonna be alert and ready to go. All right, now. It brings me to an important question. Do you want to do a hard question from the official guide? Now, this is going to be an arithmetic question. Now, please put things in the chat box and we can skip it. Uh, if, if you don't want to do it, we can skip it. But if you want to do it, please just say yes in the chat box um, and then we'll do it. Okay, perfect, all right. Okay, a few of you are saying, oh, everybody's saying yes, okay. So hard question from the official guide. It is classified as hard. I checked specifically. Uh, I, I checked the official guide. I checked the GMAT club and all the forums. Everybody thinks it's hard. So let's do this. Now, some of you might not have been exposed yet to data sufficiency questions. So I'm going to show you a question, but let me just first explain how this question works. So please don't start reading this question. You could if you're already familiar with data sufficiency, but here's how the question is structured. You have a question. The question is asking a certain specific question. Sometimes it's called a question stem, doesn't really matter. So it's a question that's asking a specific question that we are supposed to answer. We're then given two statements, statement one and statement two, and we need to determine which of these two statements would now be necessary for us to answer the question. What's interesting, if you look at the answer choices, you would notice there are no numbers in the answer choices. There are actually no answers. The answer choices tell us some combinations of the statements that we might need in order to answer that question. So if you're familiar with that sufficiency, that's great. You can actually choose an answer. If you're not familiar, once you figure out which of the statements you need, just read the answer choices and choose the one that's going to be appropriate here. You don't have any questions? Let's get started. I would like to give you now a minute and a half to do this question.
All right, please choose an answer. I'm just going to give you five more seconds to choose an answer, and then we're going to close the poll and talk about this question. All right, let me share the results with you. So it looks like the, by the majority vote, the answer is C. And then we have about a few people for A, a few people for B, and a few people for E, nobody for D. Well, let's actually see what would be the right answer. So this is a question that's very interesting because it is classified as hard. And when you look at this question, it's a little hard to understand at first. Now, Who's read this question more than once? Or maybe, oh yeah, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing this. Uh, sometimes two or three times that we need to actually read to understand it. So let me share with you what the official explanation from the official guide looks like. So uh, that's what it looks like. I don't know about you. I have a master's of math. I have a hard time sometimes reading the official guide of the way that it explains things. I'd really like to think about this question a little more conceptually, a little more like a manager. In fact, if you come to our class, I will teach you a set of skills that we, that we call think like a CEO. So I'd like to think like a CEO here or like a manager of this store. So let's think about this. Well, uh, so I have a sale and the sale is if they buy two shirts, and they pay the regular price for the first and the discounted price for the second, then they will actually, then we as a store will make the same um, profit from the sale of these two shirts as if we were just to sell one shirt. So essentially we're selling the second shirt at zero profit for us, right? We're just basically giving it away. But of course it costs us money, so we can't just give it away for free. So a customer would pay some sort of a price for it, but we make zero profit. So we're selling it at our cost, right? That's what we're selling it for. Now, notice how the question is asking us for the discounted price of the second shirt. So we are essentially being asked, what is the price the customers are paying for the second shirt? We don't really care about the first one, the second one, the one that was on sale, that was Sometimes things happen. All right, can you see, can you hear me now? All right, perfect, thank you. Yeah, whenever there's technology, something sometimes doesn't work. So I apologize for that. Uh, so I'm glad we, we kind of made it through an hour here with zero technical challenges. Hopefully we're not gonna have any. Uh, so thanks for giving me feedback. All right, so the discounted price of the second shirt is the same as it costs us, right? So we're making our customers happy. We're not really making any money on them but we are making some profit on the first shirt. All right, so we ask for the discounted price. It's the same as the cost to us. So let's see if these statements can help us figure that out. Well, the, second, the first statement tells us that the regular price is 16 bucks. All right, well, the regular price, that's great, but we need the discounted price. We don't really have enough information from this statement to figure out what is that discounted price. So statement one on its own is not sufficient. But how about statement two? It tells us that the cost to us is $12. And we just said that the discounted price is the same as the cost. So what do you think about statement two? Would statement two be sufficient? Yes, absolutely.
statement two would be sufficient. It gives us exactly what we want. It gives us the cost and it's the same as the discounted price. So we needed to think here a little bit before we actually launched into doing the question. Now, I know this is, this is a question that sometimes classified as arithmetic, sometimes it's linear algebra, things like that. It's really all about thinking more conceptually. And again, that's a skill. Now, in order to use these skills, in order to actually apply this conceptual thinking, we need something that's really important. And that is, we need to be confident to use these skills. And, and confidence is actually a really, really, really important part. In fact, I mentioned to you that I'm going to tell you what are the two things you must have on the day of your test in order to do really, really well. You wanna know what these two things are? We already talked about the first one. The first one is you need to have good habits. Habits come from preparation, from practicing, from learning the strategies, from keeping an open mind, and from following a structure. So you can actually develop these habits because on the day of the test, everybody gets stressed out. But if you have good habits, then you could do any question. Number two, confidence. That's really, really important. So if you have good habits and you have confidence, you're gonna do well. If one of them's missing, chances are the exam's not gonna go well. There's a very high chance the exam's not gonna go well. Now, with this specific question, one of the very important habits were actually this. We needed to invest some time in properly formulating what exactly is going on here. And I'd like to maybe not take a credit for this way of thinking. I'd like to use the quote from Einstein. And that is, Einstein said once that he had a problem that his whole life depended on that problem. And he had an hour. He would spend the first 55 minutes formulating the problem and then five minutes to actually find the solution. I, and when it comes to confidence, to use these skills, confidence, again, once you have a habit, then confidence comes. I wanna give you another example. Here's uh, another client. This is one of the, these five people who actually uh, just in the last week uh, told us that she got a score of 700. And the, the email subject from this person, her name is Darini, uh, she's from Montreal, said, against all odds. And, and I'm opening this email, I'm like, wow, what, what's going on there? And she's telling me that she got a score of 700. Uh, what's interesting, I'll just tell you a quick story, really quick, because it's a story that we can all learn from. Uh, so this person, for, for some reasons, I, I don't wanna talk a lot about her personal reasons, but she has very high anxiety about certain parts of, the, of her life. And um, the, the GMAT really gave her a lot of anxiety. Like right? anytime she would think about getting a good score, and she wants to go to some really good schools, in her case in, from Europe, she's from Europe originally, uh, from France. Uh, she just had so much anxiety anytime she thought about getting a score of 700. And the, the way that she really overcame it is she, uh, she, she got all the help that she needed. Uh, one of the things that we're doing uh, that I've already mentioned is uh, every Thursday we offer workshops uh, for our clients where you can come in and there's a speaker who's going to talk about different really amazing uh, strategies that are uh, on, on the surface have nothing to do with the GMAT but have actually have everything to do. And uh, she's learned a lot of really great strategies. One of them was how to keep your eye on the prize while taking your eyes off the road, right? Which essentially what this means, if you have a goal and you want to achieve it, if that goal gives you anxiety, you can break that goal into smaller steps and you can start just thinking about the next step. So she, she took our class, she got the exact strategy of what she needs to do every week. And after the class, she got the exact strategy of what she needs to do afterwards. Uh, and, wait, some of you are saying, uh, here, saying it's, it's a little hard to hear me. I am going to try to, there might be something with, okay, just give me one second. Uh, Okay, how about now? Is that, uh, is that better now? I just switched to a different headset. Um, okay, perfect, all right. Okay, technology. Twice in the last 10 minutes. 
So, um, what what she did is she just focused on one step. So she she followed the exact step by step process of getting to that 700, and she actually forgot that that's going to lead her to 700. That's why she couldn't believe that on the day of the test she actually would get 700. And she never got 700 in her practice test, but she had so much confidence that on the day of the test, she just completely nailed it. It was her first attempt and her only attempt and she got a score of 700. So that's how important is the confidence. That's how important is it to have a plan. And for some of you, the motivation is to get that 700, but for some of you saying, oh, that, that's too big of a goal. Let me have smaller goals. Let me make sure that I move towards them. Now, we talked about arithmetic, we talked about algebra. I want to talk, make sure that we talk about geometry as well. And just to talk about geometry, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a question from a very popular resource that I know many of you are, uh, are maybe considering to use. Uh, that's one of these big, big GMAT forums. Uh, so this is one of the questions from one of these big GMAT forums. Uh, and, I, and I'll give you a second. Uh, or about 30 seconds to think about it. And then we'll talk about how you can actually do this question. I'll share with you some of the things that are going on there in the discussion of these forums. So here's the question. I'm going to give you about 45 seconds. All right, uh, 10 more seconds. Please choose an answer. Now, if you don't know the answer, that's okay. Just guess. The exam needs to hear your answer before it moves forward. All right, five, four, three, two. One, all right, let's stop. I see a really nice distribution. We go a little bit on A, more in B than C looks like the right answer, then we go down to D and E. Now, geometry is one of those topics where you either love it or you hate it. I think that that's what I found a lot. I mean, I've worked with well over 10,000 people and it, it's always that, it's a love or hate. But you know what, at the end, everybody loves geometry. Because geometry is so much fun. It's actually only uh, visual mass. Uh, you got to draw some pretty pictures. I think that's amazing, right? Draw some circles and things like that. So uh, this is not a very hard question, but I wanted to pull this out just kind of to show you uh, what are the different ways, again, to approach this question. So if um, we have two circles and we're decreasing the radius by 20%, what's going to happen with the area? Well, here's the actual explanation, the recommended explanation from this forum. If you're comfortable doing that, that's great. That's amazing. If you're not, please don't despair. There is a better way. So let's talk about that way. Well, we know a, the area of a, of a circle is pi r squared. I mean, we remember that. We might not remember what's pi, but we know it's, it's R squared. And, and by the way, if you don't remember that, if you come to our class, we'll give you some exercises. So by the start of the first class, you're going to be super comfortable with this. So let's do this. I want to simplify things. So what I'm going to do is I'll imagine 
that my old radius is 10. Just to make things simple. So my old area is 100 pi. Doesn't really matter what the, the radius was. I could just pull a number out of a hat. So it was 100 pi. The new radius is going to be 8. It's 20% less. So the new area is going to be 64 pi. So what's the change from 100 to 64? Well, I go down from 100 to 64. That's a 36% drop. So I can do this in 30 seconds. Very little mass. Oh, pretty much no mass. Right? So you could, you could totally do this. And when it comes to the resources, I know uh, some people are, are uh, coming to us for advice and asking, well, look, um, why would I, let's say, come to a course if I can find any sort of a question online or any sort of an explanation online? Uh, well, one of the reasons is that many of the strategies you can't really find online. Uh, like I mentioned to you, we've spent over 10 years building our curriculum and many of the strategies are really designed to make things more simple, more streamlined, more intuitive. That's something that you can't really find online. You certainly can't find online for free. But there are a lot of the resources, there are a lot of explanations, even the official guide itself has explanations at the back of the book. So the explanations are there, but do they really teach us how to do the question? So that's what, when, as you're reflecting on what, uh, what you need to, uh, what kinds of strategies you're going to now use to prepare for the test, some of the decisions you're gonna make, here's what you're gonna think about. And in fact, many people would come to us and ask, uh, what's the best book to study, right? And um, there are different books. You know, some people use these 10 pack books, some people use a couple of books, but really the best books are the official books because they contain questions from the past exams. Uh, and I don't know if you try to read the explanations from the official guide, I've certainly shown you one. They don't actually explain how to do the questions. They don't teach you the skill. So this is actually one of the people who just in the last five days got a score, in this case, 740. So I know some of you are thinking, well, geez, how can I dedicate time to study if I work like crazy hours? And I just wanna tell you, we offer two types of programs. There's a six week and a 12 week program. So typically somebody who's gonna take a six week program is going to be studying for 20 hours a week. And somebody who's studying for 12 weeks is gonna study for 10 hours a week. So if, if you really work crazy hours, we recommend a 12 week program. So Dylan, he actually said, look, I, I'm a hard worker. I can do 20 hours a week. Doesn't matter, he works in management consulting. So 60 hours a week, no problem. I'm gonna do 20 more. And uh, he just, we just spoke a couple of days ago and he said, I just wanna specifically mention, and he wrote this on our Google review, by the way, if you haven't read our Google reviews, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, he said, I specifically used only the resources provided with the course. They were the book provided by McMaster and the official guide resources. That's all that I've used and I got a score of 740. So he just said, I just wanna mention the testament to the quality of these resources. Right? So essentially when you come to our course, if you are considering coming to our class, think of this as a one-stop program. So all of the books, everything that you need is going to be included. You don't have to go and purchase. I know some of these books are really, really expensive. Like there are books on, the, on Amazon that are like $300 for three books. Uh, and the company that publishes these books is actually owned by Amazon. So it's a GMAT prep course. Actually, one, the two GMAT prep courses that are start with a K and an M, they're both owned by Amazon. So if you think about uh, the cost of the book, sometimes uh, there's a reason behind it. Now, we will do another question. And I also promised I'm going to give you this step-by-step -step strategy that, that that's the exact process how our students prepare for the GMAT. I know for some of you, for some practical reasons, you, you wouldn't be able to come to us. So I still wanna give you that formula. But I wanna give you just a very, very quick, perhaps um, trivia question. And that is what score do I need, right? So when you ask yourself a question, I asked you, what's really important for me? Sometimes you would ask yourself a question, well, well geez, what score do I need to get into my school? Well, one of the things that you can do, and JD from Ivy is gonna be here shortly, so he'll talk about uh, Ivy and top Canadian schools. 
Uh, let's talk about top U.S. schools. I know many of you are joining us from uh, the U.S. and from other parts of the world. So here are the average scores at top U.S. schools. Here are the average scores at top Canadian schools. And the average score in the GMAT, by the way, is about 560. And just to give you an idea of what 700 score looks like, it is an 88th percentile. So what this means is that you beat 88% of people if you get a score of 700. So that brings me to an interesting trivia question. And that is, what percent of people do you think get scores of 700 plus on the GMAT? Just please put things in the chat box. I'm really curious to hear what you say. What is the percent of people that get scores of 700 or more on the GMAT? <laughs> Ibrahim, I know you've <laughs> you've been in our workshop before. All right, yeah, twelve percent. I see fourteen percent, three percent, twelve percent. All right, well, and the natural answer is it's twelve percent because it's eightieth percentile. So most of you answering twelve percent, and and that absolutely would be true. If I were to mention percent of what people, right? And actually, that brings me to. An important point about the GMAT is the GMAT is going to try to trick you very often. Please do not think of this as some sort of a, something personal against you. Uh, nothing personal, GMAT and nice people who write the question, but they gotta make the test tricky so that not everybody can get that score. So the way I, I tried to trick you right now, I apologize for that, but hopefully there was a lesson there. I didn't tell you of what people, if you think of people who do the test, that's indeed 12%. I'd like to use a slightly different measure. I'd like to use a measure of everybody who studies for the test. Because what I've noticed is that nobody, not everybody who studies for the test will actually do the test. So what's the percent of people who get scores of 700 of the ones who begin to study for the test at 0.3%. So how do I arrive at this number? Oh, this is official statistics from MBA.com. 7 million people go to mba.com every year looking for information about the GMAT. 7 million people. Of them, 2 million people will actually create an account, will register, will provide their information, their name, their email address. Of them, only 10%, 200,000 will do the test, and then 12% will actually get a score of 700 or more. So 24,000 of 7 million, 0.3%. So everybody who's just saying, okay, I'm going to study for the GMAT, it's only one in 300 people who get a score of 700. And I wanna make sure this doesn't happen to you. So let's talk about what not to do and then we'll talk about what to do and I'll give you one more question and we're gonna wrap up and JD is gonna share some really cool strategies with you. So how do most people try to study? Well, they just say, all right, I'm going to study for this test the way I studied for other tests before. You know, we, we've studied for different tests before. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the books and I'm gonna review. I don't know about you, but in my university, that's what I often did when, um, when I didn't really pay attention in the lecture. So maybe I'm gonna use the official guide, maybe one of these books. Now there's three of them that cost $300. You know, maybe those books are also published by Amazon. Um, this book is actually written by one of our instructors who was named one number one instructor in the world. Uh, so we have so many books that's so easy to feel overwhelmed. In fact, it is an overwhelming example. I don't know if, if you've started studying, you know, if you know people who've been studying for a long time, uh, it certainly could be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be, just like what happened uh, with Darini, right? She broke it down step by step. And we talked about the difference between the knowledge and the skills. And I, I, I shared that I like to use different analogies. So I'd like to use one more analogy for that to just really make sure that you can take this away with you. And that is, how do you, learn how to drive a car. Well, if you want to drive a Formula One car, learning simply the rules of the road is not going to be enough. You need to master the skill of driving. So how did we master this skill? I'm gonna give you the step-by-step -step formula, and then I'm also going to share with you what kinds of resources can you use. So here's the step-by-step -step formula. Number one, we need to know the rules. That is really important. We can't get on the road until we know the rules. So if you're thinking of the GMAT, I gotta learn a bunch of tricks. Well, it's not really about the tricks. 
um, the gym is trying to trick us. So I like to use the word strategies or skills or techniques, uh, but the theory is important. This is the foundation. We do need to know what's an exponent or what's a circle or that the area is pi r squared. So when you come to our course uh, to take this GMAT mastery program, that's really the end-to-end -end program, we, we do not cut corners. I know some of the companies are gonna charge you extra for this. Like, I know one of these companies that starts with K charges 299 US for this, this part, so we don't. So we'll give you the exact exercises that you're going to need to follow before each class and before you even join our course to make sure the theory is not a question. You're gonna essentially remember things because you've done them in school. So that's step number one, that's really important. And by the way, you have to do them in this order. That's also really important. Step number two is you gotta learn these strategies. Now, you have to learn them somewhere, right? Because unless you're already scoring 700 or 770 or 780, you need to learn these strategies. So you gotta learn them somewhere. And even people who said, I studied myself, yeah, well, of course, everybody studies themselves. But what this means is they've learned the strategies from maybe from online videos, maybe from, uh, you know, from taking online courses, but they still had to learn these strategies from somewhere. So if you have to learn the strategies from somewhere, I'd love to be the one to help you, or we as Admit Master would love to be the one to help you. I know there are other courses as well, um, and you can do your research. If I tell you we have the best course in the world, I know you probably won't believe me until you take our course. But if you read reviews online, we have well over 200 five-star reviews, then I think you know what I'm talking about. And I'll give you one reason why it is really the best course in the world, but I'll let you be the judge. So when you come to the class, we'll really focus on the strategies and we'll make sure that you develop the habits. This is really what it's all about. That's why we have this person coming every week teaching the habits, the really the soft skills of studying for the GMAT. It's not just about knowing the strategies. So that's important. And also just being in a structured setting, being around people, being the community of people who are going through the same process, that's also very important. And getting feedback is really important, right? When you're trying something, like if you jump in the pool for the first time, well, if something's not going right, you gotta get some feedback so you can do this better next time. So that's a really important process. So make sure you choose wisely where you learn things from, because whatever you learn, whatever you then practice, is going to become a habit. So you may have heard practice makes perfect. That's actually not true. Practice makes permanent. Practice becomes a habit. So you may have heard of some people having bad habits. I'm not just talking about you know, bad habits in life, but have bad habits on a test. Oh, I always have these bad habits. It's because they've learned the strategies and they reinforced them that became habits, but they were not good strategies. So they wasted a lot of time, and then it's hard to break those strategies. So that's going to be really, really important. That's why every time you come to a class, you're going to be practicing and reinforcing the things you've learned in class. We're gonna give you lots of homework. Uh, in fact, if you want to study full time and take a six week program, you'll be super busy. And you can load 40 or 50 hours a week just studying for the GMAT. So these are the exact three steps. Now, again, when I speak to many people, I say, well, well, well geez, I, I didn't really know this. And I didn't really know that there's these three steps and I have to take them in this order. Uh, and they also said, well, I didn't really know that there's actually a way for me to be guided kind of step by step. Okay. So you've come here today to, to make some really important decisions that are going to influence your future and really the direction of your career. So. All I could do right now, and again, like I promise, we're gonna do one more question right now. So my goal here was just to serve you for these two hours or an hour and a half almost, and really share some of these strategies with you uh, to help you move in the direction where you want to go and show you some of the examples from other people who walked along these paths. We, we've covered just the kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, we, we took kind of three questions from the same area and a couple more questions and we'll do one more. That's, a really, that's my favorite question. Like, I'm gonna show you this question, it's gonna blow your mind. I, I always look at this question like, wow. This question unfortunately was removed from the official guide right now, but it's an awesome, awesome question. So, uh, so I want to encourage you to really consider how you're going to learn um, 
So our program, like I meant, it is the end-to-end -end program. You can find all the information on our website. Uh, we take a limited number of people in our class. Uh, if you are curious, if you are interested, go on our website, admitmaster.com slash offer, and there's some special offers uh, for this course. Uh, we have just a couple of seats left in the course that starts in a week. We have a very special offer just for you for that course. If you want to grab these last two seats, uh, there is no more discount on our website, but you, you are going to see it as a special offer just for you. And that next course, it's a very popular course. It's weekend in the morning. It's uh, well over half full. It's just about kind of 60% full. And you can get um, you can get that course as well. Now, here's the most important thing. I want to simplify this and just say, look, you come here, you're going to get all the resources, and you're going to be coached by the best instructors in the world. Well, one, of our, one of our instructors was actually named the best instructor in the world until you're done. Right? So we're going to be on your side. So we're going to give you free course retakes for 18 months and so on. But the most important thing, until you're done, we'll work with you. Now, uh, some people are saying, well, what value am I getting actually for my money? Well, let me just give you a really, really quick overview. Uh, I have used just industry standards of how much does it cost, let's say, to take a course somewhere. So usually it's about $50 an hour to take a course. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, 50 hours. Our course is 50 hours. We give you the online platform. We give you three hours of private tutoring. We give you all the books. Uh, and we'll also give you an MBA resume review. So if you add all of this up, that's about $4,000. That's how much you're getting inside this program. And of course, you know, we, we said, look, we gotta make it affordable. So instead of four, $4,000, the regular fee for this course is $16.99. And that is in Canadian dollars, in US dollars, it's $13.99 and $12.99 euros. And if you do join uh, the course that's a month away or there's some special offers online, then you can actually get this course for $14.99 if it's at the end of August or $15.99 if it's starting next week. Most importantly, <laughs> love learning again. Well, that's priceless. We've heard from some of our clients who said, I've done lots of research, I came here, and I can honestly say, I thought this course was expensive, but after I took the course, I didn't even understand how you can offer this course so cheaply. That's an actual quote from one of our students. And the most important thing is, people are asking, what's the, what's the guarantee? Well, the guarantee is, we're going to work with you until you're done. I think that's the best guarantee. That's better than any sort of another like money back. You don't want to get your money back. You want to, you want a course back, right? You don't want to come to a bad course and get your money back. I mean, you wasted your time. Right? You want to get that score. So you'll find these special offers tomorrow. They just go on this website, adminmaster.com slash offer. You'll see exactly what we offer. And uh, for the first two people who register, we're going to give you a free MBA resume review as well. So I promised to you, I'm gonna give you my favorite question. Uh, now, I know you're tired, but remember the exam's four hours or three and a half. So bear with me, one final question. And just in two minutes, I'm gonna pass control to JD, who's gonna share with you some awesome MBA strategies. So here's the question. I'll give you 30 seconds doing this question, and then we're done, 30 seconds. All right, I, I know, I, I can see you. I, I would actually see you if you were in our real class. It's a fully interactive class where we, I see you and you see me or our instructors. I don't see you, but I can just hallucinate that you're reading this for the second or a third time. So let me help you and show you the answer choices. Do they really help? Yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down? What do you think? Do the answer choices really help? Just please put in, yes, thank you, Ibrahim. No, no, right? I mean, we look at this question and say, oh my God, where do I even start? Okay, well, let's try to understand this. So essentially, this person, the lockdown has been lifted. This person leaves and goes for a run, and there's a speed which is a variable. So he jogs for X miles an hour, and then reaches a certain point, turns around, and walks back home at Y miles an hour, and he was away for T hours. So what was the distance? All right, well, that's a question from the official guide. So let's look at the theory explanation. The distance is rate times time or speed times time. Um, we are given the speed there and the speed back, but the time is together. So 
we can maybe build a couple of equations from home and back home, the times together at t, the distance is supposed to be the same because you're just coming back all the way home and along the same route. And uh, we can build a few equations. I don't know about you, but after about five minutes, I just give up. <sighs> I told you this is one of my favorite questions. So let's scratch that. Let's talk about the mastery way of doing this question. Distance is equal to rate times time. If I want to find the distance, I take the rate, I multiply it by time. Even if you forget that, if I were to tell you, you're driving from New York to Boston or Toronto to Montreal, and it takes five hours, you're driving at 100 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, if you're in Canada. Well, I know, you know, it's 500, right? I'm not gonna be like, oh, it's 105, maybe I subtract them, maybe I divide them, like, no. 100 miles an hour, five hours, that's 500. So that's what we always do. And that's what you're gonna do even on the GMAT because the GMAT has to make sense. It's a business exam. So there are some answer choices. I don't know if you noticed where the GMAT doesn't do this, where the GMAT actually makes this illegal operation. They're trying to add speed and time. How about B, X plus T? Well, X is speed, T is time. So no, that's, that's not gonna work. How about D, X plus Y plus T? Can't do that. How about E, Y plus T? can do that. So I'm down to two answer choices. And here's the best part. So I'm down to two answer choices. I can just look at one. And if it's that one, that's good. If it's not, it's the other one. I want to be lazy. I want to be efficient. I'm going to look at an easier answer choice. That's going to be A. So A gives me miles an hour divided by miles an hour. So my speeds are going to cancel out. All is left is hours. And of course, we are not looking for hours. The question was how many miles? The only answer to this left is C. 700 level question, we've done it in 30 seconds and we've done little mass, actually no mass. So what's the chance that you're gonna do this? Uh, you're going to get a computational error if you do no mass, zero. So is that something you can learn? Absolutely. Uh, yes, I, I've mentioned to you what, what would happen if you study full time. Well, we had a client in, um, in January who said, I'm just going to dedicate six weeks to study. I'm going to take your course, do all the homework. I want to be very efficient. Start with 570, actually. And he improved. I saw 580, actually 570. And he got to 760 in just six weeks. It's actually been just accepted to Wharton. So is it possible? Absolutely possible. But your results would really depend on how you prepare. The average in the world is 560. If you take the time to learn the skills, you can get a much higher score. And now I think this year our average is probably going to be a little higher, but one in about three of our clients get scores of 700 or more. So it's certainly something that you can absolutely do. You got to believe in yourself. In fact, bring me to a final point of today. We are not going to do any more questions. Final point, and that is why wouldn't everybody? get a score of 700. Uh, I speak with a lot of people, we do a lot of advisory, people would come to us for a consultation and what do I normally hear? Well, sometimes I would hear, look, I don't have the time, right? And time is really interesting because we all have exactly the same amount of time. I remember a client, uh, he actually wasn't our client. He said, I don't have the time to come to classes. At that time they were in person, I don't have time to drive you know, 45 minutes each way, I'm just gonna try to study myself. He went to a library next door. He told me that he studied for two years, did every single question from every single book he could borrow. And his highest score was 310, he just gave up. So two hours, so don't have the time. I don't know, I, I, I think that's, that's kind of silly because we, don't, we all don't have time. It's all about efficiency, it's not about having time. Right? Sometimes people say, look, I, I don't have the money. I, you know, I, I want to get a good score, but I honestly don't have the money. Uh, you know, has there ever been a time when you really wanted something and you didn't have the money and you knew that's going to help you to take you to the next level, but you didn't have the money, but you found the money? Because when it comes to investing in yourself, that's really the best investment you can do. And that's a quote from Warren Buffett. The more you learn, the more you earn. I love it. I, it's really the, the investment in ourselves is the best investment we can make. If we invest in our skills, invest in our health, 
we go to generate so much income and make so much difference to other people throughout our careers that it just the investment is going to blow your mind. And I'm going to show you one, one example right now. And finally, sometimes people say, well, I just don't believe I can do it. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Henry Ford. I am sure you know this. I don't think this is going to apply to everybody on this call or anybody on this call, because if you guys show up here, I know that you can probably do it. I know you can get a 700 plus score. You're looking for answers. You're looking for how you're going to do it. And I know you're going to get them somewhere. So I'd love to have you here. I'd love for you to join us. And I just a final inspiration. Here's a client who came to us. Uh, so she, I think she was 580. She got 740. And for her, she really, really believed that she can do it. Right? She's like, I got to do it. This is important. I, I have some ambitious goals. So she took the GMAT after about a month after the course. And then we helped her with the application as well. That's also the service we provide. And she got a score of 740, much higher than what she got. And she got a $170,000 score. And this is crazy. $170,000. You can buy a house. Well, not in Toronto, but in some parts of the world. Just the scholarship that she got at NYU Stern, and that was her top choice. So if you believe in yourself, you're going to find a way. Right? And uh, I, I think she worked for non for profit, so she wasn't like super rich or anything. So she found the time, she found the money, she found the commitment, and look at the rewards that she got. So the question is, what decisions will you make? What's next for you? That's important. I, I was just here to serve you, to ask you some questions, and you really need to make decisions. So first of all, if you haven't been to our verbal refresher class, it's in two weeks. I'd like to really encourage you to register. You might have already registered. If you want to know where you're starting from, if you want to know, well, maybe I'm going to get 770 right now, just go to this website, trygmod.com, and you could assess your starting level on the GMAT. Now, here's the best part about the classes. Right now, our classes are virtual, which means I can see you, you can see me. In this specific call, we have a lot of people, so I can't see you, otherwise just the technology is not going to work. But in our regular class, there's usually about 10, 15 people on average. So we can see you. And that's the best part. So none of us have an excuse that, oh, I'm gonna drive and things like that. You can have the best instructors. And I know some of you are waiting for an in-person class. So let me tell you, don't. Please don't wait. It's not going to happen. Just honestly, it's not going to happen. In the next at least few months, no matter what's going on, nobody's going to offer in-person classes. Uh, and but we're going to make this really irresistible. If you take our virtual class right now, which is cheaper than the in-person class, when we do restart in-person classes, you can come for free. So you got nothing to lose, absolutely. You can get started ahead of time. By the way, all of these people that I've mentioned today, except for Diane, the, the last person, they all took our virtual classes. So the virtual classes work just as well. They're not just online classes, self-directed, self-paced. No, it's, it's a live class with a live instructor that can see you on a webcam, just like you see me right now. So you can go right now, we go to adminmaster, or go after this call, adminmaster.com slash offer. And now you're gonna fill out the forum, we'll actually contact you because that's how we, we wanna have a discussion just to make sure this is the right step for you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm also just going to launch a very, very quick poll just as we're doing a switch over. So you'll find all of this at adminmaster.com slash offer. We're gonna send you a follow up email tomorrow morning just with all of this information, just so you have a reference to it. Uh, and I'd really like to encourage you to just get in touch with us. Um, we don't bite. In fact, you can't even pay for our course online because we want to make sure this is the right fit for you and it's the right fit for other people in the class. It's a really, really close-knit community. These are the kinds of people you're going to see in the class. I've just shared some of the ideas with you. So it's a really friendly community. So we want to make sure this is the right fit for, for both sides. All right, so I am super, super excited to introduce to you J.D. Clark. I'm just going to make him a co-host right now. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just in a moment so that uh, you could see uh, J.D.'s screen. All right, so this is me. Hi, everyone. Super excited to have J.D. here with me. J.D., thanks again for joining us. I love doing these workshops for you, with you. Uh, yeah, thanks for unmuting yourself. Yeah. I just love the strategies that you share. So. I'm going to stop talking right now, um, and uh, we'll, we'll hear some really awesome 
um, MBA admissions tips from yeah, Jamie. Great. So I'm just going to share my screen here quick. So with the presentation. So can you see it OK? Uh, the screen, just let me get. OK. There you go. Can you see, can you see it, Sergey? the screen? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we perfect. Great. Very nicely. And we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. yeah. So thanks so much for uh, having me again. I always uh, uh, love coming on to the sessions. Um, and uh, it's been a while since I did the GMAT, but it's, uh, it's nice to have that reminder. So uh, thanks so much. Um, so let me, uh, what I'm going to do is take you through probably about a 10 minute presentation. So very quick. Um, I'm going to give you some advice how to approach a decision to do an MBA and also talk to you about some tips and tricks on the application process. And some of it has to do with Ivy, but a lot of it has to do with uh, different programs uh, as well as you think about putting together an MBA application. Um, here's a, I won't go into my background or anything else, but several years uh, working in higher education. Uh, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn to learn about my background, but I also post lots of articles to do with MBA programs in general, as well as uh, information about Ivy. So happy to uh, connect with you uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I came across this video a couple of years ago. This is a TED Talk by Ruth Chang called How to Make Hard Choices, and it, and it really sort of resonated uh, with me about you know, how people approach difficult decisions and the MBA being one of those. And the MBA is a very difficult decision. You know, if I think about, you know, you take a new job, you can always kind of go, well, you know, it didn't really work out. I'll go find another one. But the MBA is, is a lifelong decision. And it's really, really important that you spend time on the decision. Um, this video is very interesting in the way that Ruth, uh, just a little bit of a background about her, did a undergraduate degree in philosophy. And then was wondering, what do I do with a philosophy degree? Went to law school, hated being a lawyer, went back and did a PhD in philosophy. And her area of research was around this whole idea of making hard choices. And there's three things she talks about in this video that I think is really, really relevant. The first is what makes a hard decision. And this quote really covers it. And the best way to describe it is anytime you're faced with a pros and cons list. And you're going to find this when you look at MBA programs, you're going to find that you're going to be doing pros and cons lists. You're going to be, you know, aspects of one program you like, maybe some aspects of another program. And so you're going to be putting together a pros and cons list. The second thing she talks about, which I think is really, really important is, you know, if we're faced with difficult decisions, sometimes our default is that we take the easy route uh, around it. So we get overwhelmed by the decision and, and you tend to make the easiest decision rather than the right one. So, you know, one of the things I always talk about when I talk about this video is the easiest decision when it comes to doing an MBA program is not to do one, right? You don't have to quit your job. You know, you don't have to relocate if you're going to a program outside your city. And, and I would really, really strongly suggest as you kind of approach this decision is always do that gut check of saying, am I making the best decision or am I making the easiest decision? The third thing she talks about at the end of the video is about how you need to frame making a difficult decision. So when you look at a difficult decision, how do you kind of make a framework to make that decision? And she talks about it by asking this question of what matters most to me. And so I think that's really important as you kind of think about an MBA program is think what matters the most uh, out of a program you're looking for. And that is outside of just the academics and you know, it's also looking at the type of culture, where you're going to do the program, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I really do believe, and I'm going to talk about this next, is as you think about what matters most to you, I really strongly suggest you look at rankings. I mean, I, I did a webinar this morning uh, with a group of students from India, and, and we were talking about rankings. And, and I said, look, it's really important you look at rankings, but look beyond just the overall score. So. At Ivy, we're really proud to be number one in Canada for Business Week, I think six years in a row now. Really proud that we're number one in Canada with Financial Times, but more importantly, we're proud of components of the rankings of what matters most to us. And so what, Matt, what I would suggest is you look at rankings is really look at the components of rankings because a lot of those components are based on survey data that alumni fill out uh, to these publications. So what, we, what matters most to us is the education experience in the classroom, 
um, the impact that it's had on your career. And, and that's what matters most to us in, in everything we do. Uh, so here's a couple of our rankings we're really proud of. The Economist each year goes out and they rank 100 schools globally. And as part of the rankings, they survey recent alumni and ask them various information about their experience in the program. So for three years in a row, we've been ranked top 10 in the world for our education experience. So again, this is survey data that alumni have filled out. Same survey for four years in a row, we are ranked top 20 for what these, uh, for what our, our alumni or students going through a program thought about the career services they received. And then Financial Times actually goes out and they, they um, ask people three years after graduation and, and uh, we're number one in Canada for career progress, which is a measure about increase in salary, but also, you know, how your careers progress since finishing the MBA uh, as well, and both in, in sort of title, but also level of responsibility. We often get a question about what it takes a typical MBA candidate. And, and I'm gonna answer this in the way, and I would strongly suggest you think about this across any school that you're considering, is that there's no typical MBA candidate. And really what we're looking for is tomorrow's leaders. And, and tomorrow's leaders come from all different uh, backgrounds. And so I, I'm gonna share a personal anecdote. You'll see in my LinkedIn profile, I did my MBA at Ivy. I actually did it later on, on the higher end of sort of the work experience aspect. And the reason I did it later is I never thought I was an MBA candidate. Um, I had a degree in history. I didn't do math past grade uh, 10 or 11. Um, I didn't work in a traditional business background. I worked in the education sector. So I never thought I was a typical MBA candidate. And so I'm really passionate when we talk to candidates is never self-select yourself out of doing an MBA, never self-select yourself out of a program because we're looking for tomorrow's leaders. And we've had, you know, individuals that have gone on to, to, you know, do great things that, you know, we had a professional musician, we've had professional athletes, we've had people from fine arts, uh, from the not-for-profit sector, people with uh, arts degrees. Uh, so it, it's really, really important that you never ever self-select yourself out. To give you a sense of our profile, and on our website, we have more information or a more detailed profile, but each year we have 150 students, so relatively a, and they're split into sections, but a relatively small MBA program. Very international in nature. Uh, about 50% of our students were born outside of Canada. We have about 30% of our students coming in under a study visa, so they're immigrating to Canada, but very international in nature, 25 different passports, 24 birth countries. Very diverse is industry represented. So uh, we have 34 different industries that are represented in the program. Average age is 28. You see the range 24 to 35. The work experience we require two years minimum, uh, but the range is ten, two to 10 years and then 35% uh, female. So that gives you a sense of the class profile. Also, what you'll find is that most schools will have class profiles detailed out there. And they'll also feature, and we have it on our website as well, different student stories. So you can see just a little bit more, you know, I would say personality behind just the uh, profile that's there. Uh, I'm going to spend the rest of our, you know, probably five, five minutes together just talking about the application process and, and what we look for. This is what our assessment's based on. And, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these is your leadership experience and potential. We also ask for references that, uh, that help us uh, get some more feedback about your character and abilities and your experience. I'll talk about how we look at education in combination with the GMAT or GRE. And then finally, just talk about uh, the admissions interview. I'll also touch upon the essays. Um, just on, I won't touch much about the GMAT because Sergey just gave you a presentation on it. Um, we do accept the GRE and you'll find that across many MBA programs, uh, probably about 15% of our applicants, 10 to 15% in any given year will write the GRE where people tend to write the GRE if they're considering other programs maybe outside of business. So if you're thinking of maybe I'll pursue an MBA, but maybe I'll pursue a master's in something else, the GRE is more widely accepted by graduate education uh, in general, where the GMAT is much more focused on uh, business uh, graduate education. Let's talk about work experience. Um, we look for two years full-time minimum uh, work experience. And this really adds diversity to the classroom and the team learning. In our process, you'll have two areas where you talk about your experience. The first is the online application. And this is where you will have the opportunity sort of in bullet points to talk about what you do in your job description. We also ask for a resume. Um, 
each schools are very different in the way sometimes people have a letter of intent. Uh, we do resumes. Uh, we're pretty unique in the way we don't have any template for you to follow, nor word nor page length. And the reason for that is we want you to have the opportunity to describe everything you can, right? So we're not limiting you to any page length as well. Your resume is really what you're going to talk about is, is sort of those impact statements, sort of your impact and accomplishments you've had in your career. So the online application is very much this is what you do. The resume is very much the outcome of your job. And when you think about what do they mean by leadership experience and potential, we're no different than any other MBA program is. It's not a requirement for our program and many MBA programs that you have leadership experience, that formal leadership experience where you have people report into you. In fact, most of our individuals don't have, uh, you know, coming into a program don't have that. Uh, but we're looking for these types of experiences. And, and I show these not that you have to have everything, but it gives you that sense of what to kind of highlight in your application and what examples may you think about when you highlight your application. Uh, the first is when you took initiative, um, which is pretty obvious. So think about those times where you kind of jumped in, took initiative, your ability to get things done. A lot of people will talk about the projects that they're really, really passionate about, where you have to self-manage, uh, you know, do finish work without um, making, you know, without clear direction and kind of figure it out yourself. Where you brought big picture thinking in, so thinking much more strategically, teamwork. And this is a big thing you're going to find across all MBA programs. And the way to look at teamwork is where have you worked across different stakeholders in the organization? But the other thing about teamwork, which I think is really good, is, is when did you, you know, really help a team member? And also about teamwork is maybe where you had some uh, difficulties with a team member and how you worked uh, through it. Persuading and communicating a lot of, you know, just to give you a flavor, you know, what a lot of people use with that is the whole ability of, you know, when did I maybe have to sell an idea or, or persuade others uh, and maybe I had to communicate something. Um, making and assisting decisions. And, and I put assisting in there in purpose is that for many, for many candidates, they're not in a position where they have to make decisions, right? Like, you know, they're not the final decision maker. And I was talking to a candidate a couple months ago and, and he, well, I don't really make decisions. And, and I said, well, do you make recommendations? And they said, yeah, absolutely. I said, do they act on the recommendations? Oh yeah, most of the time. And I said, then you're assisting with decisions. So thinking about those opportunities where you brought recommendations for it and they were implemented. And the last one is, you know, solving problems. And, and so these, again, we're not looking for all of these. These are just to give you a flavor of, you know, what do we mean when we mean leadership experience and potential? But the big thing when you think about putting an MBA application forward is, is move from the thinking about what you do and move to about, you know, what are those impact and accomplishments in my professional career uh, that I'm the most proud of? Uh, references. Each school is a little different in how they do references. Uh, how we do it is it's actually a form that the referees fill out. So when you're filling out our online application, you'll provide their information, then you'll execute sending a form. You'll actually see a copy of the form. Uh, the form asks some open-ended questions and asks you to, to rate uh, individuals. Uh, we ask for a minimum of two references. You're welcome to add more. And we ask that at least one of those references be professional in nature. You know, we always get questions about who to include. And, and I will say this is that you want, as you highlight some of those experiences and think about those impact and accomplishments you want to highlight, choose references that worked with you, uh, that can observe uh, that. And so you have alignment between what you're highlighting and also the references. Really important to meet with your referees early, um, explain to them why you want to do an MBA, explain to them what you're highlighting in your application as well, and then provide them with a deadline. I, I mean, each program is different for ours, for you to submit your application, you don't need the references in, but we like the references in by the time that you go for your interview, so your admissions interview. So generally we say we like to receive the references within, uh, within 10 days. So that's, uh, um, I'm gonna talk about previous academic experience in combination with the GMAT. So all schools will look at what they call an entering average. We look at your grades from your last two years of your most recent degree. So if you did a three-year degree, I did a three-year undergraduate degree, they looked at my second, third year. If you did a one-year master's and maybe a four-year degree, they look at your one-year master's, your last year of your undergrad. They do, we do consider the program a study. So I'll use myself as an example. I did a history degree in the arts 
And so I had no quantitative courses. I had, I think, one little stats course in my first year, but I had no quantitative courses in my academic record. And so, you know, they would pay more attention to the quantitative score in, in my uh, GMAT. So we do consider that program a study. Um, we do not, this is an important thing, we don't have a minimum GPA. Um, and, and you'll find that about across most MBA programs because we can use the GMAT uh, in combination with your GPA. So if you have a lower GPA, we're gonna put more emphasis on your GMAT. The class average is about a 3.5 on the GPA or a B, you know, B plus or, you know, 78%. That's generally what our average is like. And again, if you have a lower GPA, it doesn't negate you from qualifying. It's that you have to write a strong GMAT or GRE to showcase academic rigor. And so really what we look at in your previous academic experience, along with the, uh, uh, along with the GMAT or GRE is evidence of academic capability to do well in the program. We want to make sure you're set up for success academically. When we look at the work experience, it's about making sure that you're meeting recruiter expectations and able to contribute to the learning of others in the classroom. I will share with you, my GPA was horrible. Another reason I self-selected myself out of, an under, out of doing an MBA is because uh, you know I have a daughter that's in grade 11 going into her last year of high school and there's so much focus on grades, right? Even at a young age, if you don't do well, then you're not getting to go to university, you get into university and you don't do well in your undergrad, you're not getting into graduate school. MBA programs are different because many uh, top schools require work experience, but we also have this great thing called the GMAT, which can you know showcase academic uh, rigor as well. So again, look at both of those in, in combination. I, I should mention our GMAT uh, range, and Sergey, I think you mentioned what our average is, which is around 670, but our range is quite broad. It, you know, rate right from 530 up to uh, 780. And so really, when you look at it, the range is broad, is the GMAT's only one component based on all of it. And in fact, when I go to that list of all the five things, there's not one more important than another. We, we contribute things equal. And you'll find like many candidates, it's like, I feel really good about this, or, maybe not as good about that, but we do look at files on a holistic uh, basis. Essays. Um, we asked for two essays. We asked for video essays and written essays, and they're really designed to bring personality to your application. And so when I think about the written essays, you know, make sure to answer the question. We asked two essay questions as part of our application. And the best way to make sure that you answer the question is when you give it to somebody to proofread, which I strongly, strongly suggest that you do is that you don't give them the question and ask them as they read your answers to say, what do you think the question is? Probably the best thing to do on it. I, I really think this is important is that the truth is better than playing the game is, is you know, sometimes people will approach the essays of, you know, I, I'm gonna give what I think the school is looking for. And the problem with that is when you go to the interview and they start talking about your essays and start digging deeper, if it is something that doesn't resonate with you, then, then your story collapses. So really make sure that it's authentically you. There's no right or wrong answer in the essays. It's about getting to know you. The other thing I suggest about the essays, and I talked about this in the webinar I was in this morning with a couple of other schools, and we were talking about essays and some questions that came up about it. And one of the things we talk about is we all read, um, you know, when we're reading essays as part of our admissions committee, we're reading them as individuals. So we had an admissions committee this morning when I was reading through the files last night and when I read through the files when they come in, I read the essays like I'm reading them myself. So when you're writing the essays, write it to an audience of one because it just makes it much more personalized. The biggest mistake people make about essays is that you'll have a time limit or uh, you know, in the video essays or a word limit. You gotta make sure this is a snapshot and, and you know, be, be confident that you'll have an opportunity to explain more as, as you go through uh, the interview stage. And that's really important. Um, you know, the biggest analogy I use on when you think about essays, because people struggle with, I got to fit this into the, to the word limit. And what you got to think about when you're doing the essays is think about it like this analogy, the trailer to the movie. If you think about a trailer, you know, when you're sitting there on Netflix and you flick the little preview button, it gives you about a two minute snapshot, two to three minute snapshot of maybe a, a two hour movie. And so think about the essays as your trailer and the interview as your movie. Uh, really important to be clear, concise and, and um, you know, creative. You can be creative as well, but most importantly, uh, be yourself. That's re really, really important. 
I'll just talk before I flick into interview just about video essays. So many schools we use video essays. Uh, we use two questions. Um, there is a bank of 50 questions. They're all behavior. They're, they're like icebreaker questions. So what would you do if? So there's nothing that is technical around it. The video essays, a, a couple of points about it is probably take you about 15 minutes to do. You have an opportunity to practice the technology ahead of time. We're asking you to think on your feet. So, you know, this is like, a, like an interview, treat it like such, dress professionally. Uh, but we're asking you to think on your feet. Uh, they're not trick questions, no right or wrong answer, but nerves are normal. And so that's all I'll say about the, the video essays is that nerves are normal. So we're not looking for perfection. It, it's really about getting the opportunity to know you uh, both, at, you know, providing you that option both in video and also in written word uh, as well. Interview tips. Um, our interviews are, are really, each, each sort of program is different, but I'll, I'll talk about how we do our interviews is that our interviews are done by members of our career management department. In fact, Brenda, who's there, is one of our career coaches. So the people that interview you are actually your career coaches and that you will work with in the program. And the reason we involve them in it is we want to make sure this is for your mutual benefit. We want to make sure you have the opportunity to ask questions about your career goals, uh, you know, what the school can do to support any, uh, any, you know, questions, concerns that you have about that. And our goal is to get to know your experience more to make sure that as you come into the program, you're meeting recruiter expectations of what they expect of individuals in our, in our program. I, I would say the biggest thing about interviewing, again, you're not going to expect in across many schools, they're very behavioral situations, right? And, and very much about getting to know your experience. Um, so you won't be finding any interviews that are more technical in nature, for the most part across MBA programs. But part of interviewing is storytelling. And so it's important that you're prepared, but not scripted. So be ready to talk about some of those things you highlighted, but it's, it's not about being scripted. Be important is to be yourself. Really important to do your research. It's really important to practice. I think practice your storytelling with, with a friend or a family member. And then also make sure you have intelligent questions prepared for your uh, interviewer. Some final thoughts. Um, I would say, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is whatever program that you're thinking of applying to, connect with them early on. Uh, we're here to help. And we're here to help you put together your best foot forward on your application, help you to get to know the school. And, and so it's really important that the program gets to know you before you submit your application. Um, it's important to get to know the culture of each school. I think that's really important to reach out to students in the program, reach out to alumni. You can do that even through LinkedIn and, and find that. And then last is be thoughtful about your final decision. It is uh, lifelong. I'm gonna leave you with this thought. Uh, this is a great quote. You're always one decision away from a totally different life. And as somebody that has seen thousands of people graduate through MBA programs, and, and I know myself and I know Sergey yourself too, is like, it is such a transformative experience. And, and it really, really, you know, this is not about a, you know, the first job after graduation. This is a investment in your future. It's an investment in your career. And it is truly a, a life changing uh, investment. A, a couple of next steps, if you're interested. One of the things we do to get to know you early is you can feel free to send your resume or LinkedIn profile for what we call a preliminary assessment. You don't have to do something special for us, but this is to get us to get to know your background and whether we see a fit for you to go forward in the process. Um, we have various webinars and podcasts. I mean, I just touched on a few things, but we have, you know, we have podcasts and webinars with students. We have actually a webinar about 40 minutes called Admission Tips and Tricks, where we go through this in more and more detail. Uh, we have various different Ivy Experience events. Uh, many of them are virtual right now, um, but uh, when we're able to, under the health regulations, have visitors on campus. We do a, a ton of stuff on our campus in London, Ontario, but right now all the things are virtual. And then of course, submit the application. So that's the end. I'll, I'll close off with my LinkedIn profile and, and leave it up there. So anybody, uh, please feel free to connect with me. And Sergey, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions anybody has. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, JD, for uh, joining us today. Uh, we are going to send you an email tomorrow to with uh, JD's contact information and uh, you know, get in touch as well. Uh, I, I just posted our contact information in a chat box as well. So <clears throat> please take a look. And uh, thanks again for, for sharing that, um, that, that really strategy and decision making. 
I want to leave um, leave you guys, and we're happy to to uh, answer your questions. So if you have any question, <clears throat> just please put them in a Q and A box. But I want to leave you with with kind of one uh, one final sort of my own, if if you don't mind. And that is, JD was talking about making decisions, and one of the things that uh, that's really important for uh, for being able to make the, those decisions is we talked about uh, confidence, uh, confidence in making those decisions, and maybe even I would say a little bit of a courage. And you might be thinking, well, what is courage? Courage is, uh, you know, I gotta be fearless, right? I, I gotta, you know, courage means I have no fear, uh, and that's a little bit of a probably mis. Um, misunderstanding of what courage is. Courage is not about having no fears. Courage is about having perhaps some fears. It's about being afraid by doing things anyway. And certainly making a decision to go to a business school requires some courage. Uh, I could tell you, I could be here till, uh, you know, till the next verbal workshop on, in two weeks from now, I can be here nonstop telling you stories of our clients who all came back to us and said, this was a life change decision. I'm so glad I made this decision. So you have to decide what's the right decision for you. And I, I've met a few people who um, were subconsciously sabotaging themselves and procrastinating their own GMAT prep because they were afraid of making this decision, right? So they essentially used an excuse saying, I don't have the time for the GMAT. You know, I, you know now is not the right time or you know, I'm gonna do this later because this is, was the way for them to procrastinate actually making that decision to go to a school. And I can also tell you that I hear from our clients that actually go through our program, get very good scores. I hear exactly the same phrase and, and I'm so happy. And I, every time I hear this phrase, I'm like, wow, you know, I was just expecting you to say this phrase. I should probably write it down and show it on a piece of paper. And that phrase is, what can I now do with this great score? You know, we, I just had a client, uh, she was actually one of the five that I mentioned, I didn't put her on the, on the screen, uh, but she came to us and said, I want a score of 650. And we gave her a plan, she was studying, and then a few months later, and she's busy, she's a nurse, so she works like crazy hours. So she just calls me a few days ago saying, Sergey, I just got 760, can we talk? And, uh, and we're almost the first phrase out of her mouth was, what can I now do with this great score? You know, where can I go? What's a great school that I can go to with 760? Because I was trying to sell myself, sell myself short, but now I can actually do this. So I'd like for you to call me and ask me this question. What can I now do with this great score? Requires a little bit of courage, stepping outside of your comfort zone. But please do know, if, if, if you consider yourself a future leader, you're gonna need this training and the MBA is going to be life-changing. It was certainly life-changing for me, JD, absolutely. Like my life changed completely for the better after my MBA, no question about that. All right, well, I think on this note, what I'd like to encourage you guys to do is um, take some time to really think about what's important to you take some time to make the right decisions and reach out to people who can help you. Now look, when you're reaching out to JD, please please know that the JD is not making the decision of admitting you to a school right then. When you're reaching out to me, we are not making a decision that you're gonna join our class right away. We want to talk, we want to make sure that you do make this right decision. It's all about the right fit. So get all of these things that you need to make this decision, but make that decision because you deserve it. You deserve to take your life to the next level. So you deserve to make the decision. Use us as your resources. Exactly, that's great. Thanks, Sergey. Thank you, JD, and thanks everybody. We're gonna just uh, stick around just maybe for two minutes, just in case you have any questions. For sure, happy uh, to do so. Yeah, but if not, then uh, we can close. Uh,